Hey everyone, uh, this is a pretty topical episode because, uh, you know, as you may have noticed, uh, there's some kind of thing going around. A sun virus. A beer virus. A beer virus. Um, and so this has led to, like, you know, an impressive uh, amount of closures and things and whatnot. So people are being sent home en masse to do work, and we were here doing remote work before it became cool. Um, so in all seriousness, uh, with this outbreak and with a lot of people being sent home, you, you have this, like, odd situation where tons and tons of knowledge workers who have never been remote workers or who have never necessarily wanted to be remote workers uh, suddenly are remote workers. For the foreseeable future and and i think what's unique about this is that um a lot of you who may be working remotely for the time being um are going to go back to the meat space in a month or whatever um versus like you know we've done tips for remote workers before but this is people who took like a different job and are like hey i'm a remote worker now i took a job with company xyz yeah um I want to get some terminology right here first. I think of like three levels of remote work. Um, and what we are is level three uh, at Hit Subscribe. So first there is remote accessible or like remote friendly, I guess. And that's if you work at an enterprise and mostly people come in, but if the cable guy is coming one day, you can work from home that day. That's remote friendly. Mm -hmm. That they have like a laptop and a VPN or whatever you need to do your work, and you can from time to time, if necessary, work from home. Level two is what I'll call remote first, mm -hmm. and that is companies like uh, GitHub is famous for this, I think, if, if they still are. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Basecamp. Those guys are out there, you know, banging the drum right now for remote work. So those are remote first companies, meaning that they build the idea into their company that there will be remote workers. That's not negotiable. It's just part of their standard operating procedure. And then there is hit subscribe level three companies that are remote only. We do not have any office space. We have no intention of having any office space. So we could not create a meet space work arrangement if we tried short of creating injurious policies that would make people commute multiple states or countries. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, it just couldn't be done. So we are, by default, work from home all the time, uh, which gives us a lot of experience working from home. And so it's kind of interesting to talk to people who are maybe not even, like, that interested in working from home, but there you are. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the angle we're taking here is the tips that I would give somebody who is endeavoring to become a remote worker for the foreseeable future are different than the tips we'll give people that are forced into it for a month. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's a lot of preamble uh, tips. Uh, the first one that I'll offer here is I would say keep your same schedule. Um, so every day you get up at whenever people get up, uh, 6.30 in the morning, and you shower, you do all your things, you leave at 7.30, drive to work for an hour, uh, and then you're at work at, how did that all add up, 8.30. Um, <laughs> if you're suddenly working from home, what I would recommend not doing is uh, saying, hey, great, I'm going to sleep till 8.15, and then I'm going to go to work in my pajamas. I would actually say that's fine if you were going to be a permanent remote worker, mm -hmm. but what I wouldn't go doing is altering your schedule by a couple of hours on either end if you're just going back to work in a few weeks. Yeah. Um, you're going to be doing something that is surprisingly different for you, and so I would try to keep the same general schedule. So get up at the same time, uh, have your same morning hygiene routine. Uh, hopefully that's something you do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, and then I wouldn't say go so far as to like sit at your kitchen table listening to music and shaking your fist at motorists. <laughs> but like if you spend an hour commuting and it's on the train, you know, maybe read the way you would on the train or answer emails. Uh, if you spend it in your car listening to podcasts, you know, listen to some podcasts, um, as close to your routine as you can keep as possible will keep you kind of on an even keel. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing at the end of the day. Don't feel pressure if you're working remotely to suddenly um, want to work like really long hours to kind of prove that you're working. Yeah. You know, just keep the same schedule. Yeah. Um, the pressure to like prove that you're working is very real if you're not used to being remote and if your culture isn't remote. Um, like, because I, you know, it, it seems like a, a lot of people equate like working from home with not working at all, and so you might be um, feeling the pressure to like make your presence felt digitally for a long time. Um, yeah, along those lines, I'd say that 
transitioning into the second point, I think this one is probably really important for a lot of you. If you don't have a remote, if, if your culture is remote friendly at best, mm -hmm. uh, here is an incontrovertible fact of Taylor-esque management for the last 100 years. Um, most organizations equate physical presence with work. It's almost like, what was Jonathan Stark like? That, you know, you show up to work and you get paid for, like, compensation for your suffering. So even if you're not doing anything productive, if you're at the office, you're working because, yeah. you know, you wouldn't do that otherwise. Right. <laughs> um, so there's this kind of, you know, in a lot of meat space gigs, this culture of distrust where the only way that management knows you're not gold breaking is that they can like walk around and see what you're doing, especially in this day and age with the uh, open office plan. Where... Can you... Sorry, go ahead. Can you explain gold breaking when you have a second? Oh, gold breaking, I uh, wouldn't know the formal definition, but it's um, the idea that you are kind of doing as little work as humanly possible while still getting paid. Uh, and I'm not saying that your manager like suspects you in this fashion necessarily, but um, it is kind of the office culture. You will hear things like, especially if, if there's been talk in your office of working from home, I can almost promise you you've heard things of like, well, uh, how do we know that everybody's working a full day? And like, oh, working from home, you mean watching Jerry Springer or whatever right. on during the day. Um, so there's this kind of inherent culture of mistrust. So what I would say is get out in front of that, because if this is just a temporary blip, management is going to be skeptical that you are not doing anything. Um, so what I would recommend is each day, and, and I don't mean like the way that lawyers do in like 15 minute increments, but keep track of what you've done and mo most importantly, what you've accomplished. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that at the end of the day, you would want to be able to, and maybe even actually send your boss something to say, Hey, uh, I know this isn't how we're used to working. I just wanted to give you some line of sight on what I'm doing. Uh, I've accomplished, you know, these three things today. That can go a really long way towards uh, establishing some trust in a culture that won't have it by default, where everybody mm -hmm. suspects that all of the workers are treating this as like giant coronavirus spring break or whatever. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, that's like a legit thing that happens when people work from home. Like, how do I know you're doing anything? So uh, the lesson there is... Keep track of um, the things that you're doing so you can speak to your accomplishments either when prompted or, um, you know, maybe unprompted. Uh, I don't know, have you ever... Coronavirus. Find your beach. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Wait, have I ever what? Uh, you know, it had any experience, like, do you remember working from home and, and, and the sort of trust or distrust factor for management? Because oh, you had a very meat space. Oh, I culture. did. I did. Uh, lots of lots of distrust. Um the thing that I did was I made sure that I was way more productive at home than I was at the office and uh, that that was very, like, big and visible. But, like, that doesn't mean that you were, you know, actually doing what was best for the company and meant that you were doing what was best for you. So I don't know if I'd, like, you know, add, you know, advise that. But, like, that was kind of my goal was to try to get more more time working from home. So the thing that I did was made make sure I was super productive in a very like visible and beneficial way to everyone around me to earn me some more work from home time. <laughs> the old Tim Ferriss play. Is that? Yeah, it's like if you've ever checked out the four hour work week, that's one of the things um, the author of that says about working from home. If you want to try to work from home more, kind of like tee it up so that you're making that request after a particularly like non-productive period at work for whatever reason. And then, like, almost sandbag to, like, you know, make sure that you're super productive when you work from home so you can go to your boss and be like, see, I got, like, all this stuff done. I must have really internalized that message because I don't remember <laughs> reading that, but I absolutely did it. <laughs> it's kind of a cynical play. You know, it, it probably works, though. Um, another tip that I would offer if you are new to working from home, here's what you're going to feel like doing. You're going to open up your Works IM client or Slack or whatever people use. And you're going to feel like you need to absolutely momentarily respond to everything, every yes. email, everything that comes in to prove that you are not away from your desk. Yes. Like if an email comes in, if a Slack message comes in, you're going to be right there so that nobody can accuse you of watching TV or whatever. Mm -hmm. Fight that impulse because you will be horribly unproductive. What I would recommend is there's, a, I think Erin talked about it when she did a Facebook Live, like the Pomodoro technique. Uh, you set a timer... It, with Pomodoro, it's like 25 minutes on, five minutes off. So you set a timer, close all distracting things, work for 25 minutes. Once that timer goes off, then you can go open your email, open Slack, uh, take care of all that stuff, then close it after five minutes, go back to work. 
that ensures that you're never going that long. Like nobody, I promise you, uh, well, nobody needs a response to anything in 25 minutes. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Oh, Aaron, I see you're watching. What is the app that you use that um, shuts off all your social media and like makes it so you can't access email? Uh, I'll wait for you to respond. We'll just sit here. We'll just sit with here. With no content until Aaron Stare. responds. Um, there is, so I use for Pomodoro, not, I, I don't manually shut off social media, but tomato-timer.org um, is a website where you can go do Pomodoros. Uh, that can be really helpful. Whatever you do, the main thing is I would, I would kind of create blocks of time where you're concentrating and don't feel this like obligation to always prove to everyone that you're on I am or whatever yeah. you could even get out ahead of it and explain that you're going to do this like hey I'm going to be responding to email and I am twice an hour uh, oh how do you stop procrastinating when you work from home yeah actually I was kind of at the end of that thank you for asking that Tracy, yeah, thank because you. I was at the tail end of that point yeah. um how do you do it? Because I think for me, it just feels like I have such an endless avalanche of things to do that procrastination would be impossible. Oh, that's funny. Um, I, I'm not a procrastinator, period. So I, I'd have to like, you know, um, honestly, I'd love to interview someone who finds themselves uh, tending towards procrastination because like I'd, I'd like to hear the, the, what their tips are. But I would say the tomato timer, like if I knew that I was feeling kind of spacey and my head wasn't really in it. I would use the tomato timer. That is a thing because it oh, makes yeah. me focus and then I have time off. So like, you know, I know that my, um, you know, going and reading and like, you know, spacing out in another way is coming when that buzzer goes off. Tracy, let me read what you read. Sometimes I end myself yeah. telling myself I can do it in an hour from now because I'm home all day and then I never get to something until 9 p.m. Oh, um, goodness. That's like actually still true of me. So I, any advice, I will do that. I'll kind of figure in the morning I can spend time on maybe something I, that isn't as important mm -hmm. but I like and um, I, working for myself setting my own hours not like being worried about any oversight I, I have that same thing and, and that is how I went to work until 9 p.m. Oh. so I can give some do as I say not as I do um, and, and I get back into this mode and it helps uh, what you were saying about the tomato timer helps there. So if you're saying, all right, I'm not going to pay attention to my coworkers for 25 minutes, but also, even though it's not pleasant and I may not want to get started, I can do 25 minutes. I don't feel like right. doing this. I'll just put in, you know, one of these Pomodoros, one of these tomato timer segments, and then, I, you know, and then I can watch YouTube or whatever it is you're going to do. And what I find is that if I do that, that 25 minutes kind of jolts me into a, a good frame of mind working, and then I don't actually indulge the distraction even though i've told myself to get going i can that and sort of very specific prioritization yes meaning yeah. um i'll line up my day and mm -hmm. you know i don't know to what extent people do this but um it's especially helpful in the remote context like every morning i kind of look at my day and i say in productivity books i guess these are called rocks but like what are you know i need to probably do one or two things today and if i don't do these major things it's a failure um, those are my highest priority things. And then there's other things that I'll kind of sprinkle in there, email meetings, that type of stuff. So that prioritization can, can help stop procrastination. If I've got this rock, if, if I don't do this thing today, I consider it a failure. Also, I know that starting at noon, I have a whole bunch of meetings. It's kind of easier to get myself working on that. Yeah. And now that you say that, I, I realize I do procrastinate, but it's in a different type of way. Like, you know, um, what you're saying about rocks, like the big things that you say, if I get this done, this is my project for the day. If I get this done, my day is a success. What I would do, um, before you kind of taught me like the, the rock technique is that like, I would go in and I'd be like, okay, I have this big project and it's going to take a lot of focus. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to, you know, imagine that's going to take a lot of my time. So before I do that, I'm just going to knock out some quick tasks. I'm just going to, you know, answer some people on Slack. I'm going to go like, you know, fidget with this, like whatever. And before you know it, your day is over and you have not done that big project. Cause you, you've been like, I'm going to save, you know, my mental energy for when I can really get down and focus. And instead you've just lost yourself in all those little tasks. So if you switch it so that your rock, the thing that you have to do in order to make your day a success is the thing that you do first. I mean, like, that's kind of hard, actually, for a procrastinator, because the whole problem is that, like, the advice here is, like, get the thing that you need to get done first without procrastinating, you know, but, like... You know what I might imagine, like, 
it was kind of a holistic tip and to tie it back to one of the things I said earlier, reverse engineer your day. So imagine that it's five o'clock and, and actually five o'clock or whenever quitting time usually is. Um, and then imagine that your boss isn't going to be checking email after five o'clock. Mm-hmm. Imagine that list that, you know, one or two things that you want to tell your boss you've accomplished today. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to send that email at five. So the sooner you've accomplished those things, the sooner um, you're all set and you'll be able to send out that email at the end of the day. So I, I kind of view it as like working backwards, sit down in the morning. By the end of the day, what do I want to be telling my boss I did? And by the end of the work day, not by, you know, 9 p.m. Um, and then work backwards, you know, get right to those things. Because if you do those things right in the morning, um, then they're done. And, and you could probably actually work on, you know, your passion project at work or uh, don't tell anyone I said this, but, you know, watch your afternoon TV. Because the thing is, what you'll find a lot uh, when all of the sort of eat meetings that could have been an email and all that stuff is removed from your day when you're working at home, a lot of you will be surprised at how quickly you sometimes accomplish all of your tasks for the day compared to when you're in the office. And if you kind of define what a normal workday scope is for yourself, it almost doesn't matter how many hours you work. Yeah. You could point to this and say, look, I was productive. I got things done in short order, Mm -hmm. responded to all the things. Uh, There you go. So maybe the idea that you uh, could foreseeably not have to even work an eight-hour day if you're really productive early on could be a motivator. Mm, I really like that. Uh, that's probably all I got. On, oh, I'm, I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> um, any other tips? Mm, no. Have fun working from home. It's a great experience. You get to cook yourself healthy lunches instead of going out to, you know, I think we all do our best with like Panera or whatever, but then the, you know, Panini's called you and you get that instead of the sailor, so it's nice. <laughs> Real world problems. <laughs> Working with, with cats on your laps, always really enjoyable. That's like a productivity anti-pattern. <laughs> yeah, it's great when they lay on your arms so that you're like typing like, Burr. I have experience working working from cat. Well, yeah. I mean, it's kind of fun to talk about this. We've been working remote for a long time, so it's a matter of, like, thinking back a little bit. But I do kind of, albeit a long time ago, remember that transition. Um, so hopefully it's a, you know, in as much as, like, in all seriousness, like, it's a pretty scary time. So in as much as you can take something good away, maybe you'll like the remote work. Uh, in any case, stay safe, all of you, and uh, best of luck with the remote work. We'll catch you next week. Thank <laughs> you.